Welcome, listeners, to the 200th episode of the Stories, Fables, Ghostly Tales podcast. And I am so glad to have you here. Yes! You've made it this far. You either really enjoy the show, or are a sadist looking for more punishment. (laughs) Thank you all so much for sticking with me this far. In today's episode, I want to thank Jace York and Star Eve 2099 for leaving their review on the BuzzFeed podcast page. The link will be in the episode notes. Essentially, swing by their page, leave me a podcast review in their comment section, and boom, you give this podcast a chance to be part of their podcast community post. Which would be awesome. It lets this podcast and the authors on this podcast reach even more people, which is fantastic. So I appreciate any reviews that come my way. And if you do get around to doing that, let me know so I can thank you personally. Now, I was thinking whilst I drank my Earl Grey, what haven't I done for a while? Something different that I love doing. Creepy research. So yes, today's research is keeping with the theme of this week about the paranormal, and in particular, ghosts. I'm going to give you a rundown on ghosts, spectres, apparitions, and, well, everything I can squeeze in about ghosts into this episode. And all the information that I gather will be referenced and fully credited in the episode notes. So if you want to go hunting, by all means, go for it. And if you guys and gals like this sort of research, then I can actually dive deeper into so many other different types of creatures, monster topics, and cryptids and perhaps dedicate an episode every now and then for this sort of thing. But let me jump right into this episode. Let's get it started, okay? So the content I'm covering today is as follows. Where does the word ghost come from? What are the earliest ghost appearances in media? What kind of ghosts are there? What can a ghost do to you? And how do you protect yourself from a ghost? My goal here is to touch on some uncommon and common knowledge here to keep those ghost aficionados entertained whilst educating those who aren't too familiar with ghosts in general. So let's dive in my creepy listeners and learn something different. Where does the word ghost even come from? Well, the origin is Germanic and Old English. Ever heard of ghast or geist? Maybe you have heard of ghast and just not realized it with the word being blended quite a lot in modern society. So ghost and ghast are actually really similar, but the word ghast itself has a more baser meaning. Well, to figure that out, we have to look a little bit further back into the terminology of the word ghost. Ghast means spirit or soul, with the added meaning of the pre-Germanic word of ghost being goistos, which stems from the meaning of fury, anger, or rage. There were many other variants after this, such as the Dutch version, Geist, German, Geist, and Flemish, Geist, to name a few. Eventually, they all funneled into the English term ghost. In all of this though, the word ghost, basically translated to its base meaning commonly meant supernatural being, not of this earth, made of pure spirit or pure energy and shares ties to the Old English Christian term Spiritus. So if you've heard of the Holy Ghost, it would have been referred to as Sanctus Spiritus. That might even sound familiar to some of you, which translates to Holy, Sanctus, and Ghost, Spiritus. Latin always has a way of sounding extra fancy. (laughs) Nonetheless, I find that really fascinating. And why do I find it fascinating? Because From all these cultures, there are two essential points of origin that discuss ghosts as spirits, supernatural beings, and pure energy, which is creepy in its own right. So when was the word first used? The earliest reference material that I could find on ghosts being spelt with GH was the 15th century in Caxton, heavily influenced by the Flemish ghost term Geest and funnily enough, people rarely used it. They would rather say puff of vapor or vaporous cloud rather than call it a ghost. 
because the perspective of the term ghost was pretty different back then. It was just a term that wasn't used very often and had a very different meaning. And on that, let's jump to 1884. That's when the term ghost was more frequently used and appeared, and was now defined as one who secretly does work for another. And the term ghost itself became defined as false, unreal, or a mistake. But it does put a new perspective for me when someone says ghost writer. Someone who does something on behalf of another. Have you ever heard of the term ghost being used like this? Mate, hold my beer. Dude, you haven't got a ghost of a chance. Okay, my US friends, Canadian friends, probably would never have heard ghost used in that way. Or maybe you have, I don't know. <laughs> but that ghost of a chance means exactly what it sounds like. It's a mistake to do this. What you're doing is unreal or unattainable. And it was only after the 1880s where the term ghost began to gain traction and form into the more popular media or terminology that we use and see now. So speaking of media and knowledge of ghosts, when did they first really start appearing both in fiction and non-fiction? So the earliest descriptions go far back as Homer's Odyssey and Iliad, explaining that ghosts are vanishing vapor, but that they also gibber and whine into the earth, emerging and then escaping in puffs of smoke. They are said to appear more as guides or as a resource than a creature or being in its own right. So initially, ghosts were just smoke or vapor that could communicate to humans, either as a guide or to provide information or advice. Now that's pretty strange to me, because nowhere in that does it ever communicate fury, rage, or anger in any way? But that does change. It was only once the 5th century BC came around that ghosts became the haunting and creepy creatures that we know and uh, love to this day. In fact, the play Orestia is one of the earliest forms of fiction that a ghost-like creature appeared in. And please, any historians, please don't bash my pronunciation. If anything, let me know, okay? <laughs> where Clyte Amenstra, the Queen of Argos, who is killed by her own son, Orestes, raises the Furies to seek vengeance on her son. So here's an excerpt from the first ever ghost fiction appearance. Now these are Clyte Amenstra's lines. I was slaughtered by the hands of a matricide. See these blows. See them with your heart. The mind asleep is given clear light by the eyes. You licked up many enough things for me, libations without wine, plain offerings of appeasement. Enter Clytemenstra, the vengeful ghost. Pretty distinguishing, right? Especially the comment about, see these blows. Reminds me of a ghost who's been murdered and shows you their wounds. It's amazing how long lasting these proponents of ghosts and the characteristics of what ghosts were and how old characteristics of ghosts translate into modern media and modern folklore. So what about the first cases ever reported or recorded? Let's fast forward to the first century AD in which Pliny the Younger was reported to have spotted an old man with a long beard and rattling chains in Athens. Here's an excerpt from the letters he wrote about the ghost. The ghost slowly stalked along as if encumbered with its chains, and having turned into the graveyard of the house suddenly vanished. Athenodorus, being thus deserted, marked the spot with a handful of grass and leaves. The next day, he went to the magistrates and advised them to order that spot to be dug up. There, they found bones commingled and intertwined with chains, for the body had moulded away by long lying in the ground, lying them bare and corroded by the fetters. The bones were collected and buried at the public expense, and after the ghost was thus duly laid, the house was haunted no more. I've added this letter in this episode's show notes, so feel free to read it there. Now we move on to poltergeists. In 856 AD was when the first poltergeist was ever recorded. It was noted that a vaporous energy-like creature began making noise throwing things around and smashing the place up in a family farmhouse in Germany. These two cases 
led to even more records coming forward. And slowly but surely, the term ghost gained a lot of traction. And after that point, slowly becoming a household term that everyone used. So time for a very quick recap. We know where the words come from, we know when the word was used, and we know the earliest cases of ghosts recorded, and the earliest works of ghost fiction. Now, I want to hop straight in to what ghosts are out there, to get a better understanding of how the concept of ghosts have evolved. First ghost off the rank is the apparition, also known in Latin as apparare, translated to mean the action of appearing. An apparition is a ghost-like image of a person, with the active word here being image. Strangely enough, an apparition, although a ghost, doesn't have a clear category alignment. It can sometimes be a death echo, a semi-physical presence, a revenant image, or vaporous energy. One key trait that a lot of apparitions share is this, a lack of physicality. A absence of physical presence that allows them to interact. Often apparitions are just images of what the person or thing was before passing across. They don't often stay long and often fade away, sometimes, permanently. Other times, their energy is so strong that they haunt and mark areas for good with their presence. One thing to note though, apparitions are either identified as being positive or negative energy, wherein negative energy evolves into shadow people. Arguably though, this could either be a demon or a spirit masking in that resemblance. The Booga, or Ectoplasm Ghost. This one you might not have heard, but probably have seen. This ghost is born from mischief, focuses on creating discord, and is akin to the Slimer ghost you'd see in Ghostbusters. Yep, that big green guy, inspired by the Booga. The focus of this ghost is to distract, ruin, or create discord to us humans, it's neither negative or positive in nature, and created from energy surrounding an environment or group of humans. It's essentially a human-generated energy ghost. Its key trait, of course, is flying through people and leaving an ectoplasm trail behind them. It has also been known to temporarily possess people and cause humans to exhume ectoplasm out of their pores, nose, or ears. Yep. Gross and creepy. <laughs> Our next ghost is Dread. A dark energy being that takes on many, many shapes, but all people who experience them visually or from a mental presence perspective all say the same thing. They feel an uncontrollable level of dread and impending doom. Akin to sleep paralysis, in the fear and despair caused, the dread ghost is sometimes summoned by the concentrated feelings of those in their environment. Arguing, cruelty, anger, fury, they all combine to create or summon a dread ghost. This entity will take on the form of its previous life and haunt the area. This could be a person or even a spirit of pure energy. The Fright Ghost or the EMP Ghost. EMP standing for Electromagnetic Pulse. This ghost is the hardest to spot or catch, elusive in that it knows when it's being hunted, and focuses on draining energy to supplant its own diminished energy levels. The ghost itself may or may not have sentience to some degree, but responds to people and technology in different ways. Frights have been known to absorb a person's own emotional energy and energy-based objects such as light bulbs, phones, cameras, calculators, torchlights, and voice recorders. You name it. They are the hardest ghosts to pin down and capture a photo of. They often appear when caught as vortexes. Truly fascinating. Orbs, one of the more common ghosts. They are small orbs of light that float through the air, often seen around cemeteries or places of high spiritual energy. They are often mixed up with wisps, which are fey folk or deemed as spirits. And wisps can do some serious harm to humans. See my fey episode for more information on spirits. But orbs in general, 
are soul or spirit energy residue, often collections of these that circulate in key energy focused areas, which is why cemeteries are the place to go when it comes to capturing these orbs on camera. Poltergeist. This ghost is the most commonly known form of spirit energy that can manifest itself into physical presence. Known to take on different shapes, humanoid, monstrous in nature, and even down to vaporous, semi-visible smoke. They have so many forms that it's hard to really pinpoint which one is the most common. Sometimes they're even completely invisible. These poltergeists cause all levels of destruction around them. From picking up small objects like coffee cups, ashtrays, chairs even, to larger objects like beds, sofas, TVs. They have no clear limit to their strength. It really depends on the type of energy that that poltergeist wields. And in some cases is imbued by the negative energy in the environment alone. And fun fact, the word poltergeist itself stands for noisy ghost or spirit, and rightfully so. The Vengeful Spirit. This is one ghost you don't want to encounter. When a human dies unjustly, before their time or in a cruel fashion, a creature of evil is created. Cases of people being pushed off ledges by their loved ones, stabbed to death by hundreds of blows, or tortured slowly over a period of time till death. All of these terrifying and terrible experiences create permanent spiritual scars in the person and the environment around them, and it transforms their soul or part of their soul into a new and vengeful spirit. These spirits are extremely dangerous, taking shapes and forms not only from the deceased, but also creatures of the damned, demons. They act as energy vessels to pass on the terror and the pain they experienced in life, cursed, to perpetuate that same experience to the living. Run like hell and don't look back. The only good thing about this, if you can call it good, is that the person that normally does the deed, the killing blow, they are the people that those vengeful spirits haunt. If you get in their way, you'll regret it. Spectres. Similar to ghosts, but they are always visible. They can be demons as well, or energy creatures that act as vessels for demons. Often spectres are seen as shadow people that haunt areas, leaving visible echoes of their presence in an environment. Spectres have also been referred to as cursed humans that are bound to an area due to an object or sealed bargain that they failed to fulfill. Spectres are deemed to normally be dangerous and malevolent, and normally have a physical presence. They can touch, move objects directly, essentially interact with the world around them, and consequently can inflict serious damage, just like your eye, with the only caveat for us in that they can't be hurt. Death Echoes A death echo is unique in that they are not creatures or entities, but an energy scar. Part of the soul of a human is left behind, but doesn't carry any malevolence. This soul scar replays like an old record over and over till the energy dissipates. A good example of this would be a dog dying and its owner feeling, seeing, and smelling the pet's presence in their house, remembering them that one last time. Death echoes are relatively common and normally harmless, and sometimes even considered a divine message. Lastly on my list is mylings. A sneaky treat for you ghost aficionados. Derived from Scandinavian folklore, mylings are the phantasmal incarnations of the souls of unbaptized children that have been forced to roam the earth until they could persuade someone or otherwise cause enough of a ruckus to make their wishes known and to bury them properly. I don't know about you, but seeing a deceased child making noise and destruction around or in my house is simply terrifying. And taking a spade to a kid, goodness, not something I'd be signing up for. No siree. Now that we know what ghosts are out there, I mean this isn't an exhaustive list, I can do a deeper dive next time, but for now I want to cover what ghosts can do to us 
and how do we stop them? Ghosts can harm you in various ways. Physically, their touch can be disastrous and their presence can lead to objects being thrown, smashed or even directly attacking the person themselves. Slicing, cutting, choking and even pushing have all been documented by people that have encountered ghosts, demons and spectres. A poltergeist is one such example. Some ghosts can cause intense pain by touching a person and having that person recall events that they encountered to obtain a scar on their body, or even bring on the feeling of utter despair, shock, the feeling of vertigo leading to unconsciousness, nausea, pure terror, possession in some cases, and perpetual illness. Even visually seeing a ghost is terrifying, and that depends on the type of ghost. Some ghosts are invisible, yet they cause high levels of anxiety and stress, like the dread while other ghosts cause no degree of harm at all, like orbs. Some of the worst ghosts to see though are spectres, because not only are they physically there, but they bring on a terror of their own, visually distorting their figure, manipulating your thoughts, and sometimes even causing hallucinations. And on that, ghosts can also affect your dreams and invade the mind. Once again, spectres, which can be demonic, are often regarded as having the ability to enter or possess people, and it is only the energy of the spectre and the strength of will of that person that determines the outcome. Should the human triumph, the spectre often dissipates. Should the human lose, well, possession, corruption, and personality shifts can take place, causing long-term and permanent emotional damage and mental anguish. This doesn't just affect them, but often affects the family and the community as a whole. Exorcisms often take place after a spectre has taken hold. So yeah, spectres are some of the worst ghosts you can encounter. Now that we know what they can do, how do we stop them? There are a couple of ways to eradicate, remove or limit ghostly interaction. This list is not exhaustive and not over the top in detail, however, if any of you lovely listeners want me to deep dive into rituals and protections and wards around ghosts, please let me know. Okay, so let's start with the obvious. Don't go there. Now you might be thinking, stories, come on, that was an easy one. Talk about picking the low-hanging fruit, right? Well, it's not always the case. Some ghosts are bound to specific locations. So if you enter an area, let's say, I don't know, a prison or an asylum, where some people can feel that negative aura, or even if there's been a significant amount of historical evidence supporting the fact that terrible and horrible things happened in that area. The best way to avoid ghosts and spectres in that kind of instance is obviously not to ignore that feeling and move away. There's a reason why we want to move away, and sometimes spectres and ghosts or demons can hitchhike out of their area and latch onto humans as an energy source. So it's important to listen to that gut feeling and avoid those kind of places. White Sage. White Sage is the next step up from a preventative measure. It's used as a cleansing tool. So most people grab White Sage, burn a small bundle of it, and smudge the burned herb around the perimeter of rooms, areas, or even people to cleanse them of hauntings or ghostly energy. It's a very common tool for cleansing houses and rooms. Our next tool is praying. Praying acts as a deterrent or can completely banish dark energy forces depending on the conviction of the person. There's also a prayer called the Circle of Light that has no real denomination and is believed to push away dark forces. I'll read it out for you. The words in the passage refer to God, but it could be anything that you idolize or seek support from. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well. That prayer alone is said to help those in need of banishing negative energy. Another tool for removing dark energy are gemstones. 
Agate, Bloodstone, Emerald, Black Onyx, and Peridot, to name a few, are all fantastic at staving off hauntings and negative energy. They are also especially useful as talismans in passing your own belief and thoughts to maintain your own energy. Spiritual Herbs and Ingredients The use of key spiritual herbs and ingredients vinegar, fumitory, fennel, clove, boxwood, and blackberry are some of the most powerful herbs you can use to protect, shield, and ward off evil spirits. See the episode notes for a link to information surrounding this. And that's it, lovely listeners. Oh yes, episode 200 has concluded. Yep, this ends my 200th episode, but certainly not the podcast. (laughs) Nowhere near the end of this podcast. And a huge thank you to all of you listeners. I hope you learned something new and that you enjoyed the episode. These can be a little hit and miss, so any feedback that you have, I'd appreciate it. And if you like these creepy research episodes, let me know as well. That way, I can give you even more cool content around topics like this. Here's to another 200 episodes, right? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Next week, I'll be jumping headfirst into more stories. No sleep, creepypastas, some stories by Jace York. I won't reveal any of them, so they're a surprise. And all around loads of fun. Oh. And if you know anyone who is looking for a storytelling podcast, let them know I exist. I'd love to distract them. (laughs) Thank you all so much. And yes, it is that time. This is the place where stories live. And you telltellers come to listen. Enjoy your day or night. And join me every weekday for our creepy tradition. And as always, till... Next time.